Underwood and Flinch Written and read by Mike Bennett This podcast is intended for mature audiences. Listener discretion is advised. Episode 15 Lydia entered the study to find David staring deep into the glow from John's computer monitor. Hello? Still spotting up on all things vamp? David ignored the question. Have you cancelled the excess guests? Yes, and they weren't very happy, I can tell you. Naturally, I told them it was all your fault. I mean, your orders. And seeing as how you're the new guardian, they've agreed reluctantly to abide by your demands. Good. Did you take those chairs downstairs? Anna did. But I asked you to do it. Anna's your servant, David, not me. Anyway, why couldn't you do it yourself? Don't tell me you're still afraid of the cellar after all these years. No, David answered, perhaps a little too defensively. He checked his tone. I mean, uh, I'm just busy, researching. Lydia smiled. Mm, of course you are. So, uh, how many can we expect, then? What? Guests? You said twenty, remember? Yes, I just wanted to check that you did. Oh, how could I possibly forget? So, uh, who are they? Oh, no one you'd know. In fact, they're mostly locals. Our lawyer, Senor Hernandez, and his father. Our notary, Senor Largo. Both family firms. Been with us for yonks. Then there's Miguel, my personal assistant. Conchita. The Bensons, and your sacrificial donors, of course, Beltran and Anna. I can't believe they're actually going to let you do this to them. They're nattering about it now in the kitchen. Who? Beltran the doctor? He's here now? Yes, he's just arrived. David pushed his seat back. Did he bring the blood transfusion equipment? I believe so. Oh, but you'd better ask him yourself. I'm afraid I don't speak medicalese. David looked at his watch and got up. Right then. Let's go. Lydia smiled, amused. You're very determined, aren't you? Well, I find it helps when you need to get things done. He left the room. Lydia strolled after him. You know, when I was speaking to you yesterday, I thought you lacked the balls for all of this. No offence, but I honestly thought you'd have legged it by now. Oh, I don't think I wouldn't have rather. She smiled. It's not too late. He stopped and turned back to her. His face was resolute. Yes, it is. Oh, of course it's not. There are planes flying out all the time these days, and many airports... Look, Lydia. He walked back and stopped when they were face to face. Fair or unfair, I'm the Guardian, you're not. That's it, the end. Are we clear? She traced the line of one of his biceps with her fingernail. There's that determination again. You know your eyes seem to darken to a deeper shade of blue when you're like this. It's very attractive. He turned and walked away. And don't say stuff like that either. It's fucked up. He entered the kitchen. Anna was making all manner of buffet foods for the evening and talking to Beltran in Spanish. Beltran was sitting at the table with his back to David and didn't hear him enter. Dr. Morales? Beltran turned. Yes. He smiled. And you must be David. He got up and extended his hand. Oh, Senor David, said Anna. I have to thank you for making the guest list more manageable for this kitchen. Your sister, she wanted to feed the five thousand. David shook Beltran's hand. Did you bring the medical equipment? Yes, it's in my car. Excellent. Shall we go? He held out a hand to the door. Beltran nodded and led the way out. It's uh, quite a radical step you're taking, if you don't mind me saying so. I know, but surely one that's preferable to take in a human life, doctor, said David with a subtle emphasis on the word doctor. Beltran smiled. 
Of course. They stepped out into the late afternoon sun. The droning of crickets filled the air as they walked across the courtyard towards the cars. You are a doctor yourself? asked Beltran. I was a paramedic. Was? Yeah, I teach English now. Or, should I say, taught English. Beltran chuckled. <laughs> ah, you have accepted your new position as guardian, no? Reluctantly, yes. You know, Lydia will do the job if Yes, you... thank you. She's made me well aware of her career aspirations. You think because she is a woman? No, I think because she's a nutter. Not to put too fine a point on it. They stopped at the rear of Beltran's white Mercedes, and Beltran opened the boot. She is a passionate woman, David. She always get what she wants. Yeah, well, not this time. David looked into the boot. In addition to general boot clutter, there were a number of telescopic metal stands and a couple of bulky-looking travel holdalls. He nodded. This everything? See, si, I think it's sufficient for the purpose. David gestured to a holdall. May I? See, si, of course. David unzipped the bag and looked inside. It was full of clear plastic tubes and assorted electrical equipment. Huh. Looks good, but then uh, I'm sure you know better than I do what's needed for a job like this. Lydia says blood is your speciality. <laughs> yes. Beltran's smile widened. I've always been drawn to the sight of blood. Uh, I see, said David. He looked away, suddenly uncomfortable. Well... Uh, thanks very much for bringing the gear. De nada. I'll, uh, take the bags and, well, if you could bring in the stands. Beltran inclined his head in the smallest of bows. David picked up the bags and started back for the house. Beltran took out the stands, slammed the boot door closed, and followed him. Lydia tells me you've severely restricted the guest list. That's right. For uh, safety reasons, huh? Partly. Lydia's plan to invite a trainload of people was... He hesitated a moment, then continued, using a phrase he knew would provoke the least disagreement. Contrary to the wishes of the master, it had the desired effect. Oh, of course. Beltran's tone was deferential. We must obey the master's wishes, but he also wishes to be resurrected by human sacrifice, no? And this, you feel, is optional? Well, it's a question of semantics, really, isn't it? He wishes to be resurrected, yes, said David, walking back into the kitchen. And to that end, he needs fresh human blood, straight from a living source. He put the bags down and turned to face Beltran. But I believe the term sacrifice can be replaced with donor. If we do this, we can achieve exactly the same results, but without anybody dying. Which, he arched his eyebrows questioningly, as a medical man, I'm sure you'd agree is preferable. Beltran smiled. My becoming a doctor was my parents' idea, David. I did not hear any medical calling, as perhaps you did. But still, you must surely value human life. Of course, but uh, perhaps not in the same way as you do, huh? Anna intervened. Me? I think it's a magnificent idea. I was speaking with Dr. Morales a moment ago, and we are both deeply honoured to be giving our blood to resurrect Lord Underwood. No, Beltran? Oh, see, si, of course, yes. It is unquestionably a magnificent honour. I only wish my mother could be here to see it, said Anna, beating eggs in a large bowl. Why, she would have given to be part of this ceremony. Well, I'm glad you both approve said David, picking up the bags again. Doctor, whenever you're ready. Uh, could I use the bathroom first? I need to uh, freshen up. Sure. David nodded, glad to have the chance to go on ahead. Anna will show you the way when you're ready to join me. He turned and left the room. In the library, he opened the cellar door and took a deep breath. The lights were already on below. Happy thoughts, he murmured. Negative, fearful thoughts will be turned against you. He tried to whistle, and a dry note rasped tunelessly from between his lips. He puckered up 
but just couldn't whistle, so instead he started humming and stepped into Underwood's crypt, doing as cheery a version of happy talk as he could manage. He went down the stairs like he owned them, briskly, without any hesitation, as if he were back in the army and following orders to just get down there and get the job done. But he didn't look at the coffin, so he didn't notice Lydia already downstairs and waiting for him. David, there you are. David started. Jesus! He turned to see her sitting in one of the two dining chairs that Anna had positioned on either side of the coffin. You made me jump. Feeling nervous? David ignored the question. What are you doing down here anyway? Oh, I just wondered how things were coming along. I have to say, I'm a little disappointed. It's not exactly what I've been dreaming of all these years. Oh? said David, setting the bags down beside the coffin. And what have you been dreaming of all these years? Oh, you know, tethered virgins, jeweled daggers, screaming, bleeding, the usual stuff. You like that kind of thing, do you? Lydia's reply was sensual. Mmm, <laughs> I love it. Well, I'm sorry to piss on your firework, Lydia, but tonight is going to look more like an episode of General Hospital. General Hospital meets Dracula, said Beltran, walking down the stairs to join them. Yes, said Lydia. Belly, did you ever see that old Hammer movie, Dracula, Prince of Darkness? Beltran shrugged. I don't know the titles in English. Which one was that? It was one of the Christopher Lee ones, the second, I think. I always remember there was a resurrection scene in it at the start. David started unpacking the bags. Lydia continued. Dracula was just Ash, you see, and his human servant, the David of the piece, I suppose, poured Dracula's ashes into a, a sort of man-shaped stone mould. Then he hoisted his sacrifice up over the ashes and slit his throat, and the blood all splattered down into the mould, and then Dracula rose up out of the smoke. It was very good. Beltran shook his head. No, I didn't see that one. David sniffed dismissively. He spoke without looking up from his work. <laughs> so, Dracula was like a blancmange, my old man, was he? Lydia frowned. What do you mean? Well, he sounds like he was the powdered blancmange mixture that you add milk to, you know? He glanced at Lydia, whose frown was undiminished. He smiled. It's a good thing that the servant got Dracula's ashes arranged in the right order, isn't it? I mean... Imagine he'd have got the ashes of Dracula's arse where his head should have been. Don't be silly, said Lydia. And if he did, would that arse have had fangs, eh? Just think, he'd rise up from the smoke with a fanged arse on his shoulders. Now that would be scary. Oh, for God's sake, David, Lydia snapped. It was just a bloody film. Exactly, David stood up. But tonight isn't. Which I think is something you keep forgetting, Lydia. The creature in this box isn't Christopher Lee or Bella Lugosi or any of the rest of them. That lot are all actors with pointy dentures in. But the creature in this box... He was about to slap the lid of the coffin, but then thought better of it. God help us! The creature in this box is real. And yes, while we are going to revive him, we are at least going to do it using sane and humane techniques, not B-movie butchery. Lydia rolled her eyes. Really? How quaint. She got up and peered down at his work. So what's that, then? David swatted her away impatiently. Look, why don't you just clear off, Lydia? I don't even know what you're doing down here. You're about as much use right now as a chocolate teapot. So why don't you go upstairs and give Anna a hand with the food or those robes you were going on about earlier? Oh, I see said Lydia. Of course, all the women can go and make the tea, while the men, she waved a hand at the apparatus David was assembling, play with their sane, humane Meccano sets. Oh, no, no, you don't have to feed your guests, Lydia, said David. You don't need to feed them, and you don't need to dress them up like a bunch of Jawas either. In fact, you don't even need them here at all. They're not my guests, David. They're his. Lydia pointed at the coffin. And as for the robes, are you seriously suggesting we all stand around looking like we just rolled in off the street? This is the most important sect event in over fifty years. Fine. 
so go and attend to it. I will, said Lydia. She walked to the foot of the stairs. Oh, and while we're on the subject, what size robe do you take? How the hell should I know? I'm normal. I've never been measured for satanic evening wear. <laughs> well, going by the clothes you wear, I'd say you've never been measured for anything. She looked him over. Well, you look about the same size as Beltran, wouldn't you say, Belly? Beltran considered David's physique a moment, then nodded. Oh, no, said David. I'm not wearing one of your stupid robes. Pardon? I said I'm not wearing a robe. Lydia looked aghast. But you'll look ridiculous. You can't be serious. Lydia, I need to be able to supervise things tonight. Not just the resurrection of Underwood, but also a delicate medical procedure. And I can't very well do that, flapping around the place dressed like Friar Tuck, now can I? Oh, but you must. You're the head of the ceremony. Well, so what? I can wear what I'm wearing now. Jeans and a T-shirt? Lydia was scandalised. You most certainly will not. You're the Guardian. You can't turn up looking like a scruff. Have you lost all sense of decorum? David looked at Beltran for support. Beltran shrugged and nodded gravely. I'm afraid she is right. It would be, uh, how do you say, unbecoming? David sighed. Oh, right. OK, I'll wear a robe. But I'm not putting the hood up. Lydia smiled. Fine. And I'll need to have the sleeves fixed back somehow. I don't know. Have you got any bicycle clips? Bicycle clips? Oh, David, don't be ridiculous. I suppose we might have some elastic bands somewhere. But you'll have to take them off as soon as his lordship revives. David nodded. OK, robe, elastic bands. Could you sort that out for me? Oh, of course. Lydia started up the stairs. I'm a woman, aren't I? Or would you like me to iron your robe for you while I'm at it? David looked up. Would you? With a sweet smile, Lydia raised her middle finger and left the cellar. An hour later, David stood in front of the full-length mirror in his bedroom, wearing just his boxer shorts and trainers. He held the robe Lydia had given him awkwardly in front of him, as if it might be contaminated with the Ebola virus. Apparently, it was a spare of Beltrans that he'd had in the boot of his car. It was black and made of light cotton, which had come as a surprise to David. He'd been expecting something similar to what a monk might wear, something brown and heavy. He looked inside for a label, but found none. Hardly surprising. Who the hell would manufacture these? Evidently, Beltran had had it made specially, as had Lydia, who had one very similar. David opened the robe and put it on. His nose wrinkled as it caught a whiff of B.O. from the armpits of the gown. Strange, he thought. What could Beltran have been doing in this to work up a sweat? It was hardly the sort of thing you'd wear in the gym. Then he noticed the Velcro fastenings. Hmm, not exactly gothic, but practical. He fastened the front and tied the black cord at his waist. Then he looked at himself in the mirror. He pulled up the hood, tugging it forward so it hung slightly over his brow and cast a shadow over his face. "'Oh, very cool,' he said, turning to check his profile. "'This season's must-have satanic hoodie from Lydia and Beltran of Malaga.' He turned and walked over to the window. Outside, the sky was darkening as the sun sank into its fiery bed at the edge of the world— this was it. The sun was setting on Underwood's rest. When the sun rises again, the vampire will have been resurrected, and he, David Flinch, will have done it. He will have suckled it, fed it, and nurtured it back into the world of the living. He will have unleashed the monster. He threw off the hood, sat down, and lit a cigarette. God, he wanted a drink. Maybe he could allow himself just one, just one, to calm his nerves. He smiled at his reflection in the mirror and spoke aloud. No way, Jose. Not tonight, nor any other night. The guests had started arriving about an hour ago, and he could hear them below, laughing and chatting. 
English and Spanish voices drifting up along with a truly dreadful 80s music mix that Lydia had put together. Right now, Wham's Wake Me Up Before You Go-Go was playing. David smiled bitterly. It was as if Underwood were channeling messages to him through George Michael. Then he caught sight of a stain on his robe, difficult to see because it appeared almost black on the black fabric, but the red light of the setting sun gave it a rusty-coloured tinge. He scratched at it with his fingernail. What could that be? he wondered. What does Beltran do in this thing? Maybe he watches TV in it. Maybe it's wine or tomato sauce. He remembered what Lydia had said about Beltran and his fetishes, and the thought crossed his mind that perhaps it was some sexual secretion. Quickly, he wiped his fingernail on an unstained area of the robe and looked back to his reflection. Great. Here I am, sitting in Beltran's funky, muck-stained robe, waiting to raise the Lord of the Undead. Could things get any weirder? Lydia called up to him from downstairs. David, canapes are served. In the mirror, he raised his eyebrows. Well, that's a yes, then. Lydia called again. Come on down and meet people. David stood up and straightened his robe in the mirror. Well, if I'm going to be damned, it may as well be on a full stomach. It was a warm, sultry evening as David stepped out into the courtyard. The fountain was illuminated by white light set in its pool, while all around coloured floodlights threw a warm, fiery glow against the white stucco walls. Various tables of food and drink had been laid out against the walls. No one paid any attention to David, as he was dressed exactly the same as everyone else. All the guests were robed and wearing their hoods down, eating drinking and chatting in groups around the courtyard. David! He turned at the sound of his name to see Lydia sweep from the crowd to thrust a plate of canapes under his nose. Have a canapé! He suddenly realised he wasn't hungry, but took one anyway. Thanks. I see the robe fits. You look superly sinister. Aren't you glad you dressed for the occasion? Imagine what a sore thumb you'd be if you'd worn jeans and a t-shirt. Mmm, he said, taking a bite of canapé. A real freak. Lydia wore her robe open at the chest, revealing the top of her cleavage and a small inverted silver crucifix. David nodded. Nice crucifix. Did you get it from the same satanic costume shop as the robes? She looked down at the crucifix, then back up to him with a smile. Do you like it? I think it goes rather well with the occasion. Come on. She set the tray aside and linked his arm. I want to introduce you to the few members of the sect that have survived the whittling down process. Lydia, I don't really feel very sociable right now. I'm, I'm kind of distracted. Oh, don't be silly, said Lydia, leading him forwards despite his resistance. You'll soon warm up. David was about to pull away when he saw a little old man in the group she was heading towards. Jesus, Lydia, he whispered. There's an old man here. Yes, that's Senor Hernandez Senior. He was Dad's original lawyer back in the fifties. David was aghast. Oh, please tell me he's not going downstairs. Of course he is. Oh, don't be obtuse, David. He's almost one of the family. David looked at Senor Hernandez Senior. He had to be at least eighty. David was about to object to his attendance when the old man spotted Lydia and his face lit up. Lydia, he croaked. Lydia steered David into the heart of the throng. Senor Hernandez, may I present my brother, David Flinch, Lord Underwood's new guardian? The old man reached for David's hand. Hola, and bienvenidos, Senor Flinch. I am your humble servant, as I was to your brother and his father before him. Uh, gracias, Senor. David shook Senor Hernandez Senior's hand briefly before allowing the old man to kiss it. And this, said Lydia, indicating a handsome bald man in his fifties, is Senor Hernandez Junior, our lawyer here. An honour, said Senor Hernandez Junior, 
shaking David's hand. Yes, for me too, senor. Very pleased to meet you. If I can be of any assistance in facilitating your move to our country, please don't hesitate to contact me, day or night. Thank you, senor Hernandez. Please, call me Ildefonso. Ildefonso, yes, and, uh, well, call me David. Ildefonso pumped David's hand with renewed enthusiasm. Gracias, David. This is a blessed night in hell. Yes, uh, I'm sure it is. And on earth, added the old man. Praise Satan, praise Lord Underwood, said Lydia. A murmur of consent went around the group. David suddenly felt mildly nauseous. With a polite smile, he took a step away from the group. Uh, excuse me, senors and senoras, I think I need a glass of water. Oh, well, I'll get you one, said Lydia. Here, she indicated the woman next to Ildefonso. This is Eugenia, Ildefonso's wife. David smiled and exchanged kisses with Eugenia. Encantado, senora. Then he caught Lydia by the robe as she made to leave and said, uh, No, really, Lydia, I, I think I need to sit down for a moment. Are you OK? asked Eugenia. Everyone in the group regarded David with concerned expressions. Yes, David smiled. Just a combination of heat and nerves, I think. Senor Hernandez Sr. nodded. Si, sí, claro. Tonight is a very important occasion. You should rest and prepare yourself, Senor Flinch. Uh, muchas gracias, Senor, said David. He turned to Lydia. You see, I need to rest and prepare myself. She smiled. Of course you do. Then to the rest of the group she added, We can always socialise later, perhaps in the company of his lordship. This was greeted with a murmur of awed approval by the group, and David took the opportunity to head back to the kitchen. He bowed slightly and left. He hadn't gone more than a few feet before Lydia came up alongside him again. What do you think you're doing? she hissed. You need to meet these people. Look, I just want to chill out somewhere, OK? David, these people are the members of the sect. As guardian, you need to know every one of them personally, and this is the perfect occasion to meet and greet. Fuck meet and greet. I feel sick. These people make my skin crawl. They're evil. Oh, stop being such a wet blanket. Everyone is evil at heart. It's part of human nature. It's what made us the dominant species, for God's sake. And the dominators of the dominant species? Every really successful person on earth, from CEOs to presidents. Well, they're all in touch with their inner evil, aren't they? And so should you be. It makes ruthless decision-making so much easier, which even makes it fun. Oh, bollocks. The only reason man is still around today, Lydia, is because we've evolved beyond evil and barbarity. Lydia laughed. <laughs> oh, you're such a wally. I bet you like Star Trek, don't you? Eh? David sounded hurt. What's that got to do with anything? Then Lydia noticed the Bensons approaching. Oh, never mind. These people are my best friends, so be nice. Yeah, in a minute. Tell me, what's wrong with Star Trek? Shut up and smile. She pinched his arm. Ow! Lydia brightened as the Bensons drifted alongside. Why, Cynthia, Gerald, I don't believe you've met my brother David. Ah, the Guardian himself, said Gerald. Should we bow or just shake hands? Bow, said David. Really? said Gerald, surprised. David smiled. No, I'm, I'm just kidding. He extended his hand. Nice to meet you. Ah, jolly good. Benson, said Gerald, shaking David's hand. Gerald Benson, and this is my wife, Cynthia. Lovely to finally meet you, David, said Cynthia. She moved in and kissed him on both cheeks. Lydia has been going on about you for positively ages. David this and David that. I'm only sorry this wonderful occasion comes so hard upon poor John's passing. I'm so sorry for your loss. Thank you, said David. Yes, Gerald nodded. Deepest sympathies. A good man, John, like his brother before him, by all accounts. Never knew him, of course, but uh, Lydia said he was a sterling chap. Like all you Flinch boys, eh? <laughs> Must be in the jeans. David smiled. Thank you. Anna came over with a drinks tray. Would you like a drink, Senor David? 
Uh, thank you, Anna. He looked at the drinks. Do you have anything non-alcoholic? She pointed to a glass at the edge of the tray. A still water, especially for you. He took it. Muchas gracias. Ha! <laughs> Gerald chuckled. Keeping a clear head, eh? Very wise. Uh, actually, I don't drink. Oh, no, of course not, said Gerald, taking a glass of champagne. Lydia mentioned that. Spot of trouble with the sauce in the past, eh? Yes. David gave Lydia a cold smile. In the past. Well, you're obviously a man of character, David, said Cynthia. It takes character to beat an addiction. I'm afraid I've no willpower whatsoever. What was it Wilde said? The only way to get rid of temptation is to yield to it. <laughs> oh, that's me all over. She looked David straight in the eyes. Always yielding to temptation. David smiled politely. Well, you uh, have to take life one day at a time, Cynthia. That's what they say. But uh, now, if you'll excuse me, I have to make final preparations downstairs. Oh, yes, of course, said Gerald. Nearly time, eh? The great moment approaches. Oh, surely not yet, David, said Lydia. Well, uh, I just want everything to go smoothly, Lydia, as I'm sure we all do. Lydia tells us you're going to make radical changes to the resurrection ceremony, said Cynthia. Yes, said David. I'm not going to murder anyone. Capital idea, said Gerald. Weird, of course, but uh, I'm always up for a spot of the weird. He chuckled and added with a wink, It's what keeps me so young-looking. Ha <laughs> ha! Cynthia gave Gerald a tolerant smile, then said to David, Yes, murder is, of course, undesirable, but uh, surely murder, or should we say the taking of life, is fundamentally part of what a vampire does, isn't it? Exactly, said Lydia. That's what I keep telling him. Cynthia continued, Surely, after fifty years in the grave, Lord Underwood is bound to be rather parched. I honestly can't imagine how you're going to raise him without just the teensiest spark of homicide. Well, I don't doubt that he's going to be thirsty, Cynthia, but thirsty creatures, really dehydrated creatures, can't drink fast, and they certainly can't drink very much. The body just won't take it. The rehydration process needs to be gradual, and I'm betting that the same is going to be true for Lord Underwood. Gerald nodded. Hmm, makes sense. Yes, said Cynthia, but it's not what we've come to expect, is it? What have we come to expect? said David. Dracula, Salem's Lot, the Gospel according to Buffy the Vampire Slayer? He shook his head. These are all fictions. The only facts we have are those which my family's ancestors have recorded in their diaries and notebooks. Now, I've looked through some of these, mainly those left by John, which tell me how to deal with tonight's ceremony, and there's nothing that I've read in there that convinces me that that creature in the cellar has to kill in order to live. Yes, it needs to feed on warm living blood, but murder as a necessary objective in its day-to-day -day function? No, murder is an occupational hazard, not a physiological need. I mean, think about it. A domestic dog doesn't have to hunt and kill in order to eat, now does it? You see, Lydia moved alongside David and took his arm. David's planning on domesticating our master like a common chihuahua. No, said David, moving away from her. I'm planning on teaching him how to survive in the 21st century. You were right when you said he needed to adapt to our world. And one thing's for sure... In the modern world, you can't go around murdering people willy-nilly for very long before you wind up getting nicked. A few other people began to drift over and listen more closely. Yes, but uh, not a vampire, surely, said Gerald. They'd never catch him, would they? <laughs> Why not, said David. Because you'll turn into a bat and fly away. Well, uh, yes, I imagine that would help. Hammer movies, Gerald. He can't turn into a bat any more than I can. Lydia frowned. I seem to recall that Dad told us on more than one occasion that he could. David shook his head. Stories for children, Lydia. That's all. John mentions that Underwood can turn into a bat too. 
but that has to be based on myth, maybe one propagated by Underwood himself to inspire awe in his followers. The bottom line is, one creature can't turn into another creature. It's just not possible. Tell that to the caterpillar, said Cynthia. Or the tadpole, added Lydia. Or even the ugly duckling, said Gerald. Oh, but then, of course, it wasn't a duckling at all, was it? Because uh, if it became a swan, then it'd have to have been a signet in the first place. Uh, hmm. Anyway, uh, uh, don't, I'm sorry, ignore me. No, said David. Essentially, you're right, Gerald. These are all examples of creatures maturing. But tell me this. Can a butterfly return to being a caterpillar? They were silent. No, said David. Exactly. All right, then. So even if he can't turn into a bat, said Gerald, he can't have existed for hundreds of years without giving the coppers the slip from time to time, now can he? Yes, sure, the coppers of old, Gerald, the coppers that couldn't catch Jack the Ripper. But how long do you think Jack the Ripper could evade detection these days, with all the advances of modern forensic science? Gerald pouted thoughtfully. Hmm, yeah, not long, perhaps. Just imagine the scenario for a minute. Bodies turning up, bites on the neck, drained of blood. Same thing, night after night. First based in this area, then moving south, then west. A pattern emerges, both in MO and in the direction of flight. Oh, it might take them a while, but they'd catch him for sure. So supposing you're right, David, said Cynthia. What would they do with him if they did catch him? Put him in prison? Surely he'd escape. More likely they'd put him in some sort of lab, said David. Study him, probe him, run tests on him. He'd be treated like what he is, an aberration of nature, a freak species that needs to be experimented on, catalogued and understood. I say, said Gerald, an aberration of nature? <laughs> That's almost blasphemy, David. Only if you see Underwood as a god, Gerald, and I don't. So what do you see him as? asked Lydia. A freak? David turned to her. I see him for what he is, Lydia. Just another creature, the same as we humans or any other living thing. I thought he wasn't living, said Gerald. You know, undead and all that. That's just more nonsense, said David. Dead things don't need sustenance, Gerald. They don't need to rest every night, and they certainly don't need to rest in a box for fifty-odd years. No, he's a living thing, in a state of hibernation, a state that will soon change to one of wakefulness, or at least it will, if I could be excused in order to make my final preparations. He looked at his watch. Time really is getting away from us, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, yes, of course, said Gerald. He stepped aside slightly, and the small crowd that had gathered behind him parted to let David through. David walked to the kitchen door where he stopped beside the stereo to silence Duran Duran in the middle of Hungry Like the Wolf. Everyone stopped talking and looked over. Dr Morales and Anna, David announced. Would you come with me, please? It's time. Five minutes later, David... Beltran and Anna stood gazing at the coffin where it stood on its low stone plinth. The rich, dark oak had been recently polished, and it gleamed dully in the light of the candles that burned all around the room. "'We're going to need more light,' said David. "'Let's get this turned on.' Warily, he indicated the single bulb that hung directly over the coffin. "'Lydia will not like that.' said Beltran. It will spoil the ambience. David turned to him. Bollocks to the ambience, Doctor. These candles are barely enough to see by as it is. How bright do you think it's going to be later on with that sect mob all gathered around? I could play pin the tail on the donkey with your veins if you like, but I think it would be a lot better for all of us, his lordship included, if I could see where I was sticking the needles. He is right, Doctor, said Anna. But this... Beltran tapped the bulb... It's so unforgiving. David raised his eyebrows. Well, I'm open to suggestions, Doctor. Maybe we could all wear headlights. No. Beltran shook his head. I don't have any of those. And anyway, they would not go with the robes. A voice came from behind them. Maybe someone could simply hold one of those candlesticks over you while you work. 
They turned to see Conchita coming down the stairs to join them. Forgive me, David. I know you want to prepare, but you forget. I am a trained nurse. I could assist, no? Beltran nodded. It's a good idea. Okay, David agreed. I suppose since you're going to be here anyway, you might as well lend a hand. Thanks. I mean, if you're sure you want to be, you know, up close. Conchita smiled. You think I would rather be at the back? I know I would, said David. The back of bloody beyond. But uh, let's not get into that right now. He turned to Beltran. Well then, Doctor, I suppose we'd better get this coffin open. Beltran laughed nervously. <laughs> it's funny. I feel kind of apprehensive. I don't know if it's fear, excitement, or both. How about you? David looked at the coffin. Frankly, my balls have shriveled to the size of a walnut, and I feel like I'm going to throw up. Beltran grinned. Yes, that's it exactly. Well, just keep telling yourself it's excitement, Doctor, and try to think happy thoughts. He glanced at Anna and Conchita. Same to all of you. Don't be afraid. Just try and think of Underwood as a friend that we're returning to health. I have no fear, David, said Anna. I will give my life for the Lord Underwood. Yeah, I'm sure you would, Anna, but for now all we need is a smile. Anna smiled broadly, as if she were posing for a photograph. That's beautiful. David looked at Beltran and nodded. Ready? See. Si. Okay. Let's get this lid off, then. The men moved forward and took up positions at either end of the coffin, David at the foot end and Beltran at the head. Anna and Conchita moved in close behind Beltran, ready to get a first look at the vampire when the lid came off. The men took hold of the lid. Ready? said David. Beltran nodded. Okay. We lift on three, and you step to your left, okay? Okay. One, two, three. They lifted the lid, and immediately a sickly stench filled the air. David winced and turned his face away. Anna gasped. <gasps> Madre de Dios! David and Beltran carried the lid over to the far wall. Once they had stood the lid up against the wall, they turned back to Anna and Conchita. Anna stood staring into the coffin with her hands over her mouth, and Conchita put her arm around the older woman. Beltran and David exchanged a glance, then Beltran walked over to the coffin. When he saw the body, he took a step back. "'What is it?' David asked. Beltran turned back to him. "'I think he is dead.' David picked up a candelabrum with three candles burning and walked cautiously forwards. The thing that had awaited him for so long in the coffin rose slowly into his view. The body was dressed in a black suit. The once white shirt was now an irregular off-yellow. Like all the clothes, it was loose and crumpled on the cadaver-like form, David looked at the hands that lay crossed at the chest. The parchment yellow skin was drawn tight across the bones, and the fingernails had grown long and yellow, perhaps four inches in length. David pointed them out to Beltran. Look at his nails. Beltran nodded. I know. It is normal, no? said Anna. When the body dies, the hair and nails continue to grow. No. David replied. That's a misconception. When the body dies, it desiccates, like this one seems to have done. It's not that the hair and nails grow. Rather, it's the body that shrinks away from them. He is desiccated, said Beltran. But this nail growth is considerable. It's real growth, no retraction of the flesh. David nodded. Much as he wished Underwood had miraculously died in his sleep, he knew from his recent foray into the cellar that the thing in the coffin was far from deceased. He took a few steps closer to the head end of the coffin and held the candelabrum over Underwood's face. Despite the black beard that flowed to the shirt collar, the face was still recognisable as the one he had come to know from portraits and passport photos. David leaned in closer. Unlike a dead man's, Underwood's eyes hadn't sunk deep into their sockets, 
Instead, they bulged like a pair of ping-pong balls beneath the waxy skin. Veins that appeared black and bloodless scrawled across the face and hands like the cracks in the oil painting in the study. David resisted the urge to touch them and shifted his gaze to Underwood's hairline. It was strange to see live hair growing from what appeared to be a dead scalp. He estimated it had to be about a foot and a half in length. He looks like the mummy, said Beltran. Yeah, David murmured. But why is his hair no longer? asked Anna. If I don't cut my hair for fifty years, I need a wheelbarrow to carry it around in. David shrugged. Massively reduced heartbeat, leading to massively reduced growth metabolism. His hair and nails have grown about as long as ours would in maybe six or eight months. Beltran nodded. That makes sense. Either that or the growth ended forty-nine years ago and he's as dead as a doorknob. Uh, that's a door nail, said David, leaning closer over the face. He considered feeling for a pulse, but found he couldn't bring himself to touch the body. Oh, thank you. As dead as a door nail. It sounds better. And yet if the stories are true, said Conchita, he's neither alive nor dead, but something in between. He is undead, said Anna dramatically. The lord of the undead. All right, Anna, calm down. Let's not get hysterical. I am not hysterical. I am right. You know it in your heart. I will check for a pulse. Beltran picked up one of Underwood's wrists and felt carefully, as if he were afraid he might accidentally break off the hand. David waited nervously. Well? Beltran shook his head. Nada. Did you bring a stethoscope? Yes. Beltran lowered Underwood's hand and went over to the equipment in the corner. He opened his doctor's bag and took out a stethoscope. He put the earpieces into his ears and returned to the coffin. He pressed the stethoscope to Underwood's chest and listened. After a moment, he moved it around a little, as if the heart may have drifted. Then he looked at David and shook his head. By all common definitions, this man is dead. But this is not a man, is it? said Conchita. He is a vampire, said Anna. The Lord of the Undead! Yes, thank you, Anna, you, you did mention that, said David. What's going on down there? called Lydia from the stairs. She walked into view. Behind her, the Bensons were craning to see what was going on. Uh, nothing, said David. We're just getting things ready. Come back in ten minutes. Oh, you've got the lid off. Can I have a look? Not yet, Lydia. I say, said Gerald from his high vantage position. He looks a bit on the dead side. He is dead, Gerald, you clod, said Cynthia. Undead. The lord of the undead, added Anna somberly. Can you see his fangs? asked Lydia. No! David walked to the foot of the stairs and pointed to the door at the top. Now go away. I'll call you when we're ready. Lydia trotted down a few stairs and held out her hand. Here. Two thick elastic bands dangled from her fingers. For your sleeves. David took them. Thank you. Now, please, clear off. Lydia turned and ushered the Bensons up the stairs. Go on, Cynthia. Get that arse of yours up those stairs and out of my face. Oh, shut up, Lydia, said Cynthia, giving her bottom a wiggle. You like it. Lydia slapped Cynthia's bottom, and Cynthia gave a little cry of delighted alarm as they went through the door and back to the party. David turned back to the group around the coffin. Well then, despite the fact that the patient has neither pulse nor heartbeat, we have a job to do. So, Anna, Beltran, take your places and I'll get you prepped for sacrifice. Both Anna and Beltran started. Oh, sorry, David grinned. I mean, prepped for transfusion. He pulled the elastic bands up over his sleeves and snapped them into position. Right then, senors and senoras, the hour is finally upon us. If there's any life left in that body in the coffin there, then we shall soon revive it. And after fifty years, Lord Underwood will rise again. 
If anybody needs to use the bathroom, now is your last chance. No one expressed any need. Okay, then let's resurrect this bastard, and may God have mercy on our souls. Thank you for listening to Underwood and Flinch. At the time of me posting this episode, the podcast is incomplete here at YouTube. More episodes will be added in time. If the next episode has been uploaded, you'll see a link to it on your screen in a moment. But if it's not, don't despair. The podcast is complete, along with seasons two and three, with a fourth in progress at the time of recording this, wherever you get your podcasts. You can find links in the description below. Thank you.